we begin anything, I'd like to bow our heads and start with a word of prayer, if we may. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us here tonight, and we thank you for this word that you've given us to open up. And we pray that as we open it, that your Holy Spirit would feed us, that you would teach us, that you would lead us into the, the discussion that you would have us to have, the things that you want us to learn, the things, most importantly, that will draw us closer to you. And we pray for a special blessing on each one of us tonight. Um, we think of those who are not feeling well, those who are suffering from pain, from injury, from illness, whatever it may be, we lift them up to you, Lord, and we pray for your special healing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Speaking of those people that we prayed for, I want to welcome those who are here tonight. Um, thank you for being the faithful that, that show up for all our programming. Um, it's good to have you out there, and it's even better when we get your feedback as we have our discussion. Um, we want to remember those who are watching online, whether you're on Zoom, uh, YouTube, Facebook, doesn't matter where you're at as long as you're here. Um, so we're glad you're here. And we do have Facebook open and we do have Zoom open. If you'd like to contribute to the conversation, type in your message. Uh, Christy and I are kind of tag teaming watching those and we'll get to them as we can. But we invite you to participate, whether you're here in person or here in internet form. Um, that being said, we are back in the book of Ephesians and I'm going to pick it up here in verse 15. Uh, this is an interesting section. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, it looks simple <laughs> on the surface. <clears throat> it looks like Paul's pretty straightforward here. But as I look at this, he's got a pretty powerful, powerful message in here. And he leads off, see then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. What is Paul saying to the Ephesians or to us? Stay focused. Stay focused. Yeah. Don't lose. He, he's following a theme here because he keeps saying, you know, walk in love. Stay focused and walk in love. Don't, don't step out of the bounds of that. And then he says... Uh, walk as children of light. Stay focused on that. You once were dark, now darkness, now you're light, and focus on that. Now he's saying focus on being wise, but not fools. What is he, why is he bringing that up now? Because I think uh, if we want to be consistent with the whole theme of the book, and where he's been going, uh, he, he started off at the very beginning stating that his purpose is to bring unity to the whole world, mm -hmm. that we're all together, we're all one, and his means of doing that is the church to provide an opportunity for everyone, for all people, to reflect the character of God and the image of God because he made us in his image. And so that's, that's his thrust, the whole thrust for the book. Now he's talking about what do we do? Mm -hmm. how, how, do how are we to live? And he's showing that we were once in darkness, that was the Gentiles, and now we're in the light. Those are the true believers, the true Israel. And how are we supposed to, to 
conduct our lives. And that's what he says. Be very careful in this translation. Be very careful how you live, not as the unwise, but the wise, making the most of every opportunity. So he wants us to carefully ref live a life that reflects the image and character of God to facilitate in that unifying process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just want to welcome you guys. Come on in. Make yourselves at home. We're in Ephesians 5. We just started in verse 15. It's an open discussion, so if you have something, by all means, ask away. Amen. You betcha. Yeah, and and well, we do have a number of people watching online that are not in the building here, but they're watching. Who knows yeah. where? We have some even in the Philippines, I believe. Huh? We do. We do. Um, so, yeah, walk wisely, not as fools, and then you tied it in. Verse 16, my version says redeeming the time, which kind of makes someone stop and think, wait a minute, how do you redeem time? Because what does it mean to redeem? Save. <laughs> to save or to buy back or, or to get back. And, and we all know that once time goes, you know, once that water goes under the bridge of the clock, it, it's gone. You can't get it back. But I like your version there, Jack. Uh, New International Version, I believe yeah. it is. Because it says making the most of every opportunity. Yeah. And, and that's really what I was wanting to get into. I think that's a very important part for us because he, he qualifies that when he says, because the days are evil. Hmm. Now look around our world today. Are our days yeah. evil right now? Yes. Or do they at least look it? I mean, uh, they're out of control. They're out of control. Um, the word chaos comes up. Of course, that's because we got the meeting starting about breaking the chains of <laughs> chaos on the 30th. Um, but it is. You look at your world right now. It's in chaos. It's out of control. Um, it seems like we're, we're going downhill. Yeah, you say out of control there, Bob. You make me think of an airplane that has lost control and is just spiraling downward. And that feels like where our world is right now. It's just spiraling out of control and, and heading down for a crash landing. I'm thinking about your translation, redeem time. And when I first hear that, I'm going, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you redeem time? But in the context, he says, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity. In other words, we have spent a lot of time wasted. <laughs> and we don't have time to keep living like we have been in the past. Now we need to make the most of every opportunity to kind of make up for the lost opportunities that we've had. I kind of think okay. that may be what he's saying. Okay, here. so there's a little combination. Urgency. Here. And, and Christy, you know me. I, I will just talk away. So at That's any point, okay. you can just jump right in. <laughs> but this, this right here, the, these two verses reminds me of something in Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, if you guys want to turn there with me. This, to me, speaks of a condition. Um, you know, we, we see where it says, because the days are evil, but it also says redeeming the time. And as Jack was just explaining, you know, making up for lost time, in other words. Yeah. Uh, we, we've missed opportunities. We've missed time. We, things have kind of been just set there and not really moving forward. And in Revelation 3, it actually starts in verse 14. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the oh, Amen, yeah. the faithful yeah. and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. <laughs> I, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm... And neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyesab, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous." And repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Amen. 
and, and it yeah. goes on with with you know to him who overcomes but the picture that this paints here is remember it's to a church so it's a group of people it's not one individual it, it, this is this is to a church a group of people and not cold or hot we're just kind of wasting kinda, time kind of <laughs> sitting here you know i'm i'm a christian i i've accepted mm-hmm. jesus I'm, you know, and these are all good things, but I'm not hot for Christ. On fire, you might say. I'm not on fire for Christ. And I'm not ice cold either. I'm not just, you know, I don't want anything to do with this. But I'm just kind of sitting here, dare I say, warming the pews. Exactly. You know, lukewarming the pews. Lukewarming the pews. (laughs) Not even warming them up all the way, lukewarming the pews. But I mean, the idea here is that, you know, how many people are Christians when they're in church, but when they go out those doors, it's, they leave it there. You know, they, they, they walk away and leave it behind. Yeah, I think Christy had something. <clears throat> well, back in Ephesians 5, um, verse 10, what I like about Paul is that he makes things so practical. Mm-hmm. You know, he... he gives us these little snippets of, well, this is what you can do. Because when there's a problem, I want to know what can I do to fix it. Right. So that's what I appreciate about this. Back in verse 10, it says, uh, and try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Yes. So how do we learn what's pleasing to the Lord? We have to go to his word. Right. And pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. And so then there in in the verses, you know, it's advising us in um, 17, you know, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Again, Mm -hmm. how do we find out what the will of the Lord is? And that's to go to his word. Amen. And pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance while we're while we're going there. And then. You did read this already, but I really love the verse of 19, um, addressing one another or joining together with one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with all of our heart, because that is what changes us. Yeah. It's amazing how, how music and words and songs and can actually change us and we can be in a terrible mood and then we start singing a a song of praise to the Lord and it can just change us in an instant even when we don't feel like we want to be changed amen amen well and I think that's the picture that we saw in Revelation too you know you're blind but by eye salve you're you're naked but by clothes from the Lord and on all of it get it from God amen it's all turned back to God and that I think that's what you're saying here is you got to go back to God um, to get it. That's actually the punchline for the three verses that go before it. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, I, I, I wanted to play, go back to what Christy did, and it was insightful to go back to verse 10, find out what pleases the Lord. Uh, the, the original meaning of that is to test things. And how do you test everything? He said, test everything. How do you test mm-hmm. it? You have to test it with the scripture. And we should have, you know, God doesn't want us to be running around worrying and frantic. Oh, am I doing this right? Or does God want me to eat a potato, a tomato? Or, you know, he doesn't want us to be like that. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, he wants us to get so used to when we get an idea, something to do, something to see, something to believe, something to watch or eat, is this something God will approve of? And if we do that consciously over and over, then pretty soon you do it subconsciously. Yeah. You just do God's will. And that's the point that I think he wants us to get to. Well, and that's that, that where he says that he'll write his laws on our heart. Yeah. That's the same thing as it's 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 become part of us it's become a lifestyle it's not it's not superficial anymore 
Um, and I hate to use the word superficial, but, you know, let's face it, when, when you come in and it's just, I'm only a Christian while I'm in the church building, and when I leave, I'm whoever I want to be, well, there's a little superficiality to it. When, when, but when I start practicing it outside the doors too, then it starts, God starts working that into my lifestyle, and it becomes, like you said, it, it becomes natural. It, it's something that, that comes through us from Christ. Yeah. Yeah. I also like in here, um, you know, he says, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, making the most of every opportunity. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And everything's kind of hinging off that, that how, how are we spending our time? And I think that gets into what you're talking about, Jack, with what we watch, what we eat, what we drink, you know, because we can spend our time related to God's word, related to prayer with God, related to God and consciously thinking and and abiding. That's the word I like to use, abiding um, with God. But it's real easy for us as as Christians or humans or whomever of I set aside a specific time, and when that time is done, I set it aside, and then I move on with the rest of my day. And there's a disconnect there. You know, it it becomes, I use God while I need him, and then I set him aside on the the shelf. You know, and I would argue we need God all day. Well, that's what we want to get in the habit of thinking. You know, is this this a part of the two ways? He puts two ways, darkness and light. And so... We should consciously and even subconsciously be, am I doing the things of darkness or doing things of light? Or the wise or the foolish? The same thing. And, may, oh, go ahead. So therefore, we need to understand what the Lord's will is. And that's what Christie was saying. The only way, you can't judge what's light, light or dark by the context, societal context and customs of the people. The only way to know is what's written in the Word. That's what we have to, and that's why, you know, we try to to base our whole religious faith on the Scripture, no matter what anybody else is saying out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's the message I I like from this. Well, and I think that's where Christy brought out the, the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, let's face it, it says because the days are evil and, and there's a lot of darkness in our world right now. Yeah. No matter where you go, you, you're surrounded by darkness, it seems. Yeah. And, and it's interesting when Paul was in prison in Philippi, I mean, the, the things that he went through before he got into prison. I mean, they, they took him to the magistrates, they tried him, they beat him. And then they threw him in the darkest prison down there, no light, no nothing, you know, rock walls, and he's locked up in there to face trial after that, and an earthquake happens. But before the earthquake happened, I think it was Paul and Silas were in there in that prison and they were singing. They, they were praying to God, they were praising God, they were singing, they were, you know, at any time that they could have complained... You know, it, that would be it. You know, man, that wasn't fair. You know, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a Christian. I, I didn't do anything wrong. These people railroaded me. They, they beat me without cause. You know, and it's real easy for that complain mode to take over. But Paul and Silas were doing the singing. They were praising God. The earthquake happens. The, the jailer, I'm just going to do a quick summary here. The jailer was... My job, I'm going to be the next guy who's beaten and they're going to take my life. I'm, I'd rather just take my life right now and not have to suffer it. And what happens? Not only was Paul and Silas and, hey, whoa, 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 it's okay. We're still here. It wasn't just him. It was also the other prisoners. They were all loose. They all could have escaped. Yet through that, that singing and praising God and that melody in their heart, other people were affected in a positive way. So in the middle of that darkness, there was actually light. They lived as light, you know, like Paul was mentioning before. That, that verse 19 is uh, 
especially brought to light in contrast with verse 18. Mm -hmm. He says, do not, first, before that even, don't be foolish, but understand the Lord's will. And then, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit and speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And if you... I know he said here that you're not supposed to talk about the bad, the immoral things, you know, so I try to avoid that. But unfortunately, I haven't always been a good boy, and I know what it's like to be like verse 18. And the, the, the thing to me, when I read that about don't get drunk on wine, the picture that I get in my mind and I always try to put it out, but I'm just trying to help you understand what's going on here, is all the times that I had partied and done all these things, it seems like when I got to a certain point, we all just started singing. And I don't know how to sing. I have a <laughs> terrible voice, but I would be bouting out like I was the great Caruso or something. Mm -hmm. And it embarrasses me now even to, mm -hmm. to talk about that. But that's what God is saying. Don't act like an idiot. Don't do all these crazy things. Be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, that's not something you can do. That's something you have to let God do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I can go pour a drink and get drunk, but I can't make the Spirit come into me. I just have to let God do it and exercise what He puts in me. Yeah. And if I'm filled with the Spirit, then I'm going to do things like... You know, I sing hymns and stuff now, but I sing them quiet enough so people can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Except when I'm in the shower. <laughs> The pe people will notice I turn the mic off when it's time to sing a hymn. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> or step back from the pulpit so it doesn't pick me up. Especially but, when it's live streaming because that's all you're going to hear is you. Yeah, sorry, fo <laughs> sorry, folks. Yeah, that's just how it is. Um, but that being said, there's something else that I, I want to bring out of, uh, of that as well because, you know, someone who's going out doing the party and all that, that's temporary. Very temporary. It's very temporary. And, and I say that because the moment you start sobering up, the the moment that all those whatever's going on in that sobering up process, all of a sudden you start, I mean, you really start plummeting. And by morning when you wake up and you're, you're, you're sick, your head hurts, you're sore, you know, oh, I'm never doing that again. Oh, no, I'm never going to do that again. And you know, how many times did we hear that? How many times have we said it? Um, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a constant. Yes. You never come down from that. And that's not to put it in the light of, of a drunken spirit that you never sober up from. But, I mean, it is a spiritual uplift that... While you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there, there are times when you grieve. Don't get me wrong. There's times when, when you grieve. That's human nature. But the Holy Spirit is still there. You, you've not been abandoned from it. And you don't grieve like the rest of men who you have no hope. without hope. Exactly. Not without yeah. hope. Um, we're sorrowful because we've lost someone that we love, that we care for, and we're going to miss them. But we have the hope that we're going to see them again. Yeah. And when you have the Holy Spirit, that's still there. You know, you're still sorrowful, but you know you've got the hope of seeing them again. So there's really, a, a, I think, another contrast, compare contrast going on here. You, know, you were once darkness, now you're light. You used to be a, a Gentile, but now you're a, a child of the King. Um, you walked in darkness, you're, you're walking in light. Um, walk in love, not as you used to walk. You know, all these things you used yeah. to be this, but now you're here. And, and act like it. And, and don't be unwise, but be wise. You know, don't be a fool, but be wise. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled by the Spirit. So there's a lot of compare contrast here. And I think Paul is listing this out, as Christy said, to make it practical. And the practicalness of this, he shows, you know, it's going to show, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all 
things. Now, that's the hard part. Giving thanks for all things. I don't know about you guys, but I have a hard time giving thanks for all things. There are things that happen in my life that I really don't feel very thankful for. But Paul's saying, give thanks. You know, I think it would be good to just reflect in your personal devotion life, your devotional life, re reflect on verse 19. Think to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do I do that often? How often do I do that? I think we should meditate and reflect on, on that thought in our devotions every morning. You know, Lord, that's the way I want to be. And I have to admit, I don't spend my whole day in that. I'm not saying every all day long we got to be saying, you know, I love you, Lord. And, but mm -hmm. it ought to be a consciousness that, that we are different from everything going on around us in the world. And we owe it all to God. Yeah. And, and no matter how bad things get, we can thank him. It's not worse. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> but, you know, what, what if? I mean, let's be real. Because there are times when we're not happy or, or thankful or everything, and our spirit does get down. But instead of dwelling on it and spreading it out to everybody in negativity, what if we went to God with my problems. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking not too long ago, I, I was walking my dog. I, I do it twice a day religiously. Um, she needs it. I do too. But I was walking my dog and I had chapel at the school the next morning. And for chapel at school, I usually like to use a life story, something that the kids can connect with and make a biblical application to it, a little short devotion, you know, with a story. And, and I'm walking along and I'm like, it's been a long school year, Lord. I'm running out of life stories. I'm not old enough to have that many <laughs> stories. <laughs> and not interesting stories for kids, you know. I mean, so I, I'm just, I'm walking along and I'm walking along and I'm just, for the life of me, I've got nothing. And I, I'm feeling pretty, pretty bad about this because they're expecting when the pastor comes in, you know, when you get little cards that say, you're the best storyteller ever <laughs> and, and all this, you know, out of the mouth of babes. But you get this, that you, now you know they're expecting you to come in yeah. with something that's going to affect their life. And I've got nothing. I mean, zero. And I'm praying to God about it, praying to God. And I'm even looking up at the sky. And as I'm looking up at the sky, I saw one of those falling stars just shoot across the sky. And I sat there and I looked at that, well, that was neat, you know, and I started analyzing it. It was kind of green, probably space metal, you know, and kind of going on. And then it was almost as if the Holy Spirit was tapping me on the shoulder saying, <laughs> you wanted something. <laughs> Here's your story, you know. And, of course, we relate it to seeing Lucifer like a falling star out oh. of heaven. Ah, okay, here we go, you know. Yeah. But if we go to God... Instead of spreading that, I could have called people. I could have complained about it. I could, man, do you got something? I could have Googled it or whatever and tried to come up with something. But instead, I went to God. And by the time I got back from that walk, I was actually elated. I was feeling good because now I had something. God answered my prayer. So can we do yeah, that? Can we, we can. shift gears from the negativity, spreading the negativity, and turn it to, God, I'm down. I need uplifting. I uh, had a story similar to that, but it wasn't. It wasn't uh, exact. It wasn't exactly the way you had your experience, but I think it's something that gives us courage. I was, I was really worldly guy, and I got converted, was baptized, and two months after I was baptized, I was the pastor of a little Adventist church in Oklahoma. And I did not know much. I was single. I was a bachelor pastor. I didn't know a lot of Bible. And my head deacon called me up and said, Jack, he'd been head deacon in that church for a long time. He said, Jack, we need you to come over. My wife and I are going to split up and we need your help. 
Mm. Now, two months passed her, and I'm single, and I don't know anything about being married. So I'm going over there, and the whole way, I'm, what do you think I'm thinking about? You know, I'm just saying, God, help me. I, I'm over my head here. You need to help me. And while I was in on that visit, it was amazing the stuff that came out of my mouth. Hmm. Things I didn't even know I was talking about. Mm -hmm. God just mm -hmm. put it there. And after that visit, you know, they stayed together. And Amen. after that visit, I was on my way home. I had to just pull over on the side of the road and I was, I, I just shook. I had, I wept because God will take control when, when we surrender like that to Him. And, it, and I think that's what it means to be walking in the Lord. A piece of it, anyway. I think, I think God likes those times. When, when, we're know, complete, <laughs> when we're completely helpless and we got yeah. nothing, you know, because how can we block him? We can't. And that's, that's his time when he can shine. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like you said, we can't give credit to ourselves. That was all God, <laughs> you know. Um, God is wonderful. He works in powerful ways. That way. So about <clears throat> we did have a question here from Dina on Facebook. So why does Paul compare being drunk with wine with the singing to the Lord? Why does Paul compare being drunk, drunk with, wine with wine or contrasting? Or contrasting mm -hmm. Because he says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And then goes on into the speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and singing. And, um, and I think probably being drunk with wine is looking for something to mm -hmm. fill ourselves whether it's wine, whether it's um, uh, drugs, whether it's activities and the uh, things that cause the adrenaline rush, mm -hmm. you know, any of these, we're trying to fill an emptiness that's inside. And we know that that emptiness can only be filled through God and through the Holy Spirit yeah. and his living within us. That's the only thing that's going to satisfy so I think, fact, I think that's why he... Would you agree that they're really looking for God, mm -hmm. but they're just going to the wrong places? Yeah, because they don't know what it is they're missing. Yeah, they we don't, don't know. We don't know what we're missing and, and until so it's we like God can is experience saying, I have this. something better if you just listen yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, just well, pay attention. Well, you know, I think... <laughs> It reminds me of a song, and I'm going to quote a, a short line from it, looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think part of that is because that's what we grow up learning from our families or from TV or from books or from magazines or from, you know, you name it, whatever it is in our culture, that's what we've learned. That's where we go to look for this stuff. We look for love in the laundromat. We look for love in the bar. We look for love at you know, all these different places. And God is like, hello. Yeah. I'm yeah. here. I've, I've got this for you. But the wonderful thing about God is he never forces himself on you. You ever notice that? He never forces himself. He can be awfully convincing sometimes. But, <laughs> he gets but, pretty persuasive he sometimes. He gets very persuasive, yeah. but he doesn't force it. He yeah. lets you get to the point to where you have nowhere else to go. Yeah. And then he's always there. I don't know if we answered your question, Dina. Uh, I got a hunch you have an answer, too. So send it in to us and we'd By like to hear. By all means. We'd It'll take at least a minute to get to us because there's a delay. <laughs> there's a little delay there. But, um, yeah, imagine filling yourself with, you know, the, I remember learning this at one point. They, they call it self-talk. Have you ever heard of self-talk? Got a couple heads nodding out here, self-talk. You know, um, what do you tell yourself? And I don't mean out loud, but what do you tell yourself in your mind? You know, you look in the mirror, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm too, this makes me look fat, you know, or, um, you know, man, I've got bags under my eyes. And, you know, but it doesn't take too much of that. And you've talked yourself down and, and you're, you're already drooping for the day. 
Um, you know, and that can go into your work performance, that can go into school performance, that can go into relationships. You know, you name it, whatever you self-talk, if it's negative, you're dragging yourself you're gonna, down. And you're going to do it. And you're going to do it. You wind yeah. up fulfilling what, you, what you've just self-taught. But if your self-talk is positive, and I think in the context of what we're talking about here, singing hymns, psalms, you're, you're self-talking, but you're self-talking about God. Yeah. You know, you're reminding yourself that no matter what I am, God is the one. You know, Jesus Christ's blood covers me. Uh, when no matter how bad I am, no matter how worthless I may be, his righteousness is what covers me. Um, God's love is what fills me. It's all hinged upon him. The singing and, and having a child, again, um, singing music is a very powerful way to self-talk. Yeah. It, it implants in the brain better and faster through music than almost any other way. So, well, and that's why in our Sabbath schools for the children, mm -hmm. that's we, especially in the younger ages, we focus the majority of the program on the songs that they're singing and repeating them every week, every Sabbath that they're there, that they're there talking about how God loves us, how Jesus loves us, how he loves our family. And, you know, really getting that ingrained because just like me growing up, going to Sabbath school, I remember these songs now, so many years later, and you'll be going through mm -hmm. some difficult time or, you know, really stressing about something. And all of a sudden these words will just pop into your head mm -hmm. and praise the Lord for that, that mm -hmm. we've learned them even at a young age. You want a verse that talks about that? Sure. Romans 8, 5, those who live according to their sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on what the Spirit desires. So whatever we fix in our minds controls what we're going to do. And I think that was a perfect example. I think we just made a connection back here to what Christy brought out earlier in verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, in verse 17, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, Paul brings it home here by reminding yourselves with those songs, with the hymns, with the psalms, you know. Um, and Dina pointed out, too, um, as far as all the different variety of music that's talked about here, too. Yeah, it's not just one kind, is it? Right, yeah. You know, every, everybody has their favorite um, style of music, their, their favorite genre. Um, and it's interesting, Paul uses several different genres here. In other words, Paul's not saying it's just one type of music and everything else you have to discard. But we we should be open to, you know, different styles of music are going to speak to different people. Well, this may be a good place to invite everybody here and online to come Friday night and praise the Lord in music, right? We have, we have I don't music see bluegrass in here, but I sure do believe it's there somewhere. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's written as Southern Gospel. <laughs> um, no, it's not in there. But it's uh, music in your heart, and that's what we yeah. do on Friday nights. Well, it covers it there, and spiritual songs. Oh, there you go. That, that's the blanket, spiritual yeah. songs. Um, if you can sing a song that brings you closer to Christ. And I think that's the rule of thumb that we would be talking about here. Um, evangelist Jim Stevens, I know Pastor Jack knows him. And you got this. he was here in this church uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. Um, anyway, in a conversation when I was down in Paradise Valley, um, somebody was asking him about, well, you know, what is it okay here or is it not okay there? And he said, you know, he's, he said, I have a general rule of thumb. Is it bringing me closer in a relationship with Christ? If it is, it's probably okay. If it is not, then I should probably step away from that and reevaluate what I'm doing. Um, and I think that fits right in with what this is. Yeah. Is it drawing me closer in a relationship with Christ or not? If it is, continue doing it because you're, you're being edified. You're being drawn into a relationship with him. 
if it is drawing you away, and I would suggest not to pick on drinking, but since Paul pointed it out, being drunk with wine, I don't think draws us closer to Christ. Um, it draw, now it may drive us to a point where we bottom out and it opens a door yeah. for Christ, but that's not in of itself drawing us closer right. to Christ. It's like Satan overstepping his boundary and whipping you so badly that you'd finally turn to God. Yeah. Uh, the whipping you isn't part of God's plan, but it works in, in our favor. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's wow. Romans 8, 28. You were in Romans 8, 5. Romans 8, 28, just a little bit later, uh, where it says, For we know that all things, all things work, work together yeah. for good for those who love Christ. And so even those times when we're suffering, God can use that to bring us into a relationship with him. And Dennis made a comment on Facebook. I notice it says to make music from your heart and not just from your mouth. Okay. So it's important that when we are singing... That is coming from our heart, too. And it works both ways. Because like I said, we might not feel like we want to sing that song right now. We don't feel it, but it will change us, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and for those who are not necessarily singers but instrumentalists, and it says, if it's from the heart, it's the same effect. Yeah, I yeah. like, um, well, for example, Jaime George. Yeah. I've heard mm -hmm. him play songs on his violin that just almost bring tears to your eyes and so it's just something about music isn't there yeah yeah, yeah I can't wait to get to heaven so i can do it yeah. and i think it's great that paul even includes and making melody so that's not necessarily <laughs> singing that's what does that mean instrumentalist that, that means, oh. well, well, yeah. and i think too it means that <laughs> even if you're not gifted right you know, for those of us, I don't know if you play an instrument, but for those of us who don't play an instrument and don't necessarily sing well, you know, but I'm still singing from my heart. Right. I'm making that joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> and, and that in of itself, you know, I don't have to sign a contract because I can sing well. But if I'm singing to God and my heart is connecting to him. The word melody to me sounds like the opposite of a lot of the music we hear, so-called music that we hear today. And I'm wondering if, you know, that's supposed to be there to say, I don't know the technical terms, like I'm not a musician, but to say your music needs to be a melody, not this rattled stuff that doesn't seem, it just seems to clash. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You think he, he means something like that? Could don't be. know. I guarantee you there's coming a day when we can ask him. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that day. Um, but, yeah, I, th I think Paul is thinking in terms of music. Um, things that are uplifting, um, tunes, melodies, things that are drawing us closer to Christ. Um, and not, you know, you can, you can do things in such a way that it pumps you up, but not necessarily drawing you closer to Christ. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that, but you know, by the time, by the time you get all pumped up and, and everything, you're ready to go, but you find yourself, I'm not really thinking of Christ. I'm just pumped up and there's a difference mm -hmm. there. That's the difference between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. Yeah, I think it's important that we notice the being filled with the Spirit and, and being drawn closer to Christ. Again, evaluating where am I at the, you know, in the midst of this and at the end of this, where am I? If I'm with Christ, if I'm filled with the Spirit, then I'm probably in good shape. If, I'm, if I have fallen away, if, I've, if it's become more about me than about God, then I've probably stepped out of the realm of where I'm supposed to be. Well, summarizing this whole thing, are we carefully walking in the light? I think that's what Paul is trying to admonish us to do. Carefully walk in the light. You know, there's one more thing here in verse 21. Submitting to one another in the mm -hmm. fear of God. And submitting... 
I think I think Paul uses that as, as his um, corner turning phrase here uh, to get into the next passage. Well, it goes backward to what we've been talking about in one sense, but then now he's projecting it yeah. forward into three things: uh, marriage and uh, parenting and slavery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he's using this to to shift gears, but. Before we go in, and we got about 15 minutes, before we move into it, what does it mean to submit to one another? That's open question. Yoked. What does it mean to be equally yoked? Okay. That's, that's what it isn't. <laughs> but what what does it mean to submit? We're not on husband and wife yet, but just us here. We should submit to each other. What does that mean? The more we believe together, alike and agree, the easier it is to submit. Is that well? True? I think I think Matthew chapter eleven. Jesus opens up a little bit about this yoke that Sharon's bringing out here. Um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is another favorite passage of mine. You might hear me mention this, I don't know, 50 times in a month. But um, Matthew 11, 28. should be able to recite this, but just to make sure that I get it right. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and, are, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think it starts with yoking up with Christ first. Before we can, before we yeah. can submit or, or yoke up with anybody else, we have to submit and yoke up with Christ first. Without Christ in the equation, it's not equal. There, there's an un, unequality. Inequality. <laughs> inequality, thank you. <laughs> I, I was like, man, I don't know. I know that's not right. There's an inequality there in that yoking. Well, yeah, and, and I understand what you're saying. Being equally yoked means having Christ first. Yeah. And then Christ will be yoked. That's the wonderful thing about right. Christ's yoke is because we think of yoke in the terms of a yoke of oxen and we're, we're getting into a modern era where we don't talk about yokes <laughs> that much anymore and I'm not talking about eggs. Um, I'm, talk, I'm talking about, you know, used to, you would get a pair of oxen, uh, which are kind of like cows, but they're for work, and, and a piece of wood that went between the two and they teamed up together and they would pull your plow or your wagon or whatever it was, but they had to work together at the same pace, at the same time. Um, they were together in it. There, there was no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go this way, no, I'm going to go that way, because you're yoked together. So this submitting and equal yoking that you're, that you're talking about ties right into that theme of unity that Paul's talking about. What I'm getting out of this, the submitting and the yoking and all this, is I need to bring my pride down and swallow it and submit, you know. And how do I submit? Now, i got to be careful here because submitting, especially when you get in the context of the next passage, can get pretty yucky. Um, I want to be very careful how I mean submit. But submitting to one another, is it okay, let's use a leader, let's do a little case study type thing. You have a leader, and the leader is always right. The leader is never wrong, and you have to do what the leader says because they're the leader. And if someone else comes up with an idea, it doesn't work because it's not the leader's idea. The leader has to be, you get the picture that I'm painting here. If the leader never accepts anybody's ideas or any information from anybody else, but it's all about me, ego. ego, 
Ego, yes, ego, pride, it's all about me. How far will the organization that's being let go? It won't hold up, will it? You have to team up with other people. There are times when Pastor Jack has a marvelous idea or Christy has a marvelous idea. We sit on our board, even in our church business meeting where everybody's involved. There, People will come up with something that I'm just like, that's pretty good. Let me write that down. You know, <laughs> I had thought about that, you know, but that gets back to this body of Christ that, that Paul's been writing about in the book of Ephesians. Um, we all work together, unified towards the same goal. So that submitting to one another. And again, I, I still hold that we submit to Christ first. He's our leader, mm-hmm. all of us. And, and our example. And our example. Which is what we're going to see in the next verses coming up. Right. Yeah. Constantly. So if we are if we are yoked up with him, if we are submitting to him, then the submitting to one another, there's a little discernment involved. Are they submitted to Christ? Bill. Correct. It was meant to be read to the, the church members in Ephesus. Now, so you're submitting to other Christians. You're not submitting to Archimedes or Aphrodite or something like that. You know, uh, I think in extremely general terms, you're correct. Now, there are times when someone from a different church or a different belief system will have a good idea that, that okay, you know, that's a good idea and we, we, we can work with that. But I think there's very explicit... You know, we go here first. I think we emphasized that earlier. You know, we're in the Bible first. Is it according to the will of God? Um, But in general terms, I think, yes, that's what we're looking at is it's church related. How are we moving the organization forward? How are we moving this church forward? Um, And again, this was a letter that was written and meant to be read in multiple churches. So it was not just one specific church he was talking about, but... Talking about Christians in general, yeah. those who are following Christ. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the following segment, which there's no way we're going to have time to... We can broach it. To, yeah, we won't be able to... Anyway, we're, we're walking we on thin ice we're if we hit the first part and don't go yeah, to the second. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, this following segment is going to answer some of these questions that you're bringing up right now. And I, I think that it, before we get into the husband-wife relationship, looking at the environment, our social environment today, it may, not, it may be valuable to spend a little bit of time talking about what is marriage, period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because that's a, that used to be a no-brainer, but it's a pretty hot topic today. I don't know. It's it's been think. broadened out as far as society is concerned. Yes. The definition has been broadened. Right. Um, not God's. Not definition, compared. But. Not compared to the biblical definition. Yeah. That, so it depends. It depends. You know, as, as you may be watching, it depends on do you subscribe to this or do you not. Um, when we talk about marriage, we're talking about um, a specific what's outlined in the Bible. Um, there are different definitions, and I'm going to I'm going to step out here on a on a thin limb and then step right back. Okay, <laughs> so bear with me as I step out here on this limb. The principle applies in any relationship. Uh, the principle applies in all relationships. In fact. Um, Dr. Emerson Egerich's, um does a whole series. Uh, do you know who I'm talking about? No. It does a wonderful series. Uh, it's called Love and Respect. Um, and it's all based right here on this passage that we're getting ready to get into. And he emphasizes, while my focus is we're talking about a marriage relationship, it applies to all relationships because... Man, we're going to get deep into this. <laughs> but we're but we're talking about how do we relate to one another? There, there's a, a little psychology that goes into this. That a lot of psychology. That, well, thank you. A lot of psychology <laughs> that goes into this. But Paul is hitting on this really before his time. 
it's before general public has come into this understanding. In fact, general public is still not here. I would say Paul was a couple thousand years before his time easily uh, when he hits on this, which also tells me that that is a God-given wisdom. Um, but the submitting to one another. And Dennis does have a comment, a couple of comments um, concerning verse that verse 21 about submitting to, okay. to one another. Uh, it means to respect each other. And as we have studied in previous chapter 2, to build each other up in unity. Mm-hmm. There, now I can see the comments. And then Dina has a sweet little story for the end, too. We're almost at the end um, of time. We're not at the end of Ephesians by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, Dina, Dina is... Uh, just to introduce her for those who might not know her because she's been home a lot recently is Pastor Jack's wife um, and she serves in a lot of capacities in this church but she she's shared a story and I, I just like to go ahead and, and open up that up now I think that'd be a good spot this would okay. be a good spot for it so Dina shares um, the other day we had a sick hummingbird at our feeder mm. all puffed up and breathing heavy eyes closed. When I stepped outside, he almost didn't see me. Not I, until I jumped towards him from a foot away did he feebly fly about 10 feet away. I remembered the song we learned as children. God sees the little sparrow fall. I know he loves me so. Touched my heart. God knew about my little hummingbird and he knows about me too and cares. Is that a God you can submit to? A God who cares about even the tiniest bird. Hummingbirds are smaller than a sparrow. Is that, is that a God that we can be in a relationship with? Is that a God that we can pair up with? That we can walk through life with? That we can entrust to, to have that yoke around me that ties me to him. In other words, I'm trusting that he knows where he's going, so therefore I'm willing to be tied to him so that no matter where I go, it's with him. And, and he will not lead me, he will not even let me get off the path. And I think that's where the, the equally yoked comes in. Is It's this whole theme of staying on that path. If we're yoked, we're going to the same place. We cannot stray apart. And that's where that submitting comes into. You know, sometimes, and, and I'm going to use this, this example, sometimes churches get into awful arguments about the color of the carpet. A couple of people know what I'm talking about. They've been there. Uh, fortunately, I've not yet, but I've heard the, the, the aftershocks of it. Folks, there comes a time... There comes a time when we have to decide, is it worth fighting over? Is it so important that I have to have my way that I cannot concede and just say, you know what, let's do what, what is best here for the good of everybody. And the color of the carpet really it's not that important. But if it means that, that Jim Bob over there, and I'm pointing into a blank area, if Jim Bob over there, if that means that Jim Bob gets the color that he wants and because of that he feels part of this church and he doesn't leave the church, is it okay to sometimes say, you know what? Yeah, we can put a blue carpet in here. It doesn't really match with anything else, but you know we got a lot of ladies here that can find what does match, and we can rework this. You know, I'm making this more complicated than what it needs to be. <laughs> but folks, in all honesty, it starts with Christ. Amen. We have to be willing to say, "Is this so important to me that I'm willing to let it come between my relationship with Him?" 
Is there something in my life that I am not willing to give up? Is there something in my life that I'm willing to turn around and walk out that door to give up on Christ, to give up on eternity, to give up on salvation, to give up on the relationship with the God that cares so much about a little bird that he notices each one when it goes down? Is that so important to me that I'm willing to lose that relationship? Or can I submit to him? Can I follow him? Can I go wherever he leads me to go? No matter where it looks like I might be going, trusting that in the long run, he's going to lead me to a place where I can live forever in paradise. And if I can do that, can we do that together? Can we all team up together and yoke up with him? Can we submit ourselves together to him? Yeah. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that you care so much about life on this earth. That there are things that are so important to you. A little bird. Things that we would tend to just walk right on by and never give a second thought. You pay attention to. And yet there are things that mean nothing to you and we'll stake our eternal life upon it. Father, we pray that you will yoke up with us, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, that you will keep us on that path. Never let us off the path. Never let us out of the palm of your hand because we are human and we will do it at the drop of a hat. Keep us focused, tuned in to you, and most importantly, keep us in that close, growing relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Folks, again, thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. I love your comments. Um, I love your input. Uh, I love your perspectives. And if you have any questions or maybe you see something where you'd like to go deeper into this or get a little more clarification on something, reach out to us because we, we don't have any problem having difficult conversations and we can do it and still call you brother or sister when we walk away. Uh, God bless you and good night.